standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth for ever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north, it whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor, man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The word vanity means something empty or worthless. And if you are like me, you have probably asked the same question as I did. How can all our labor in this life be vanity? Surely our labors must be of some profit. This is the opening question posed by Solomon in his opening thought. And I believe it was the object of King Solomon in writing the book of Ecclesiastes to answer this very question. Much of the book of Ecclesiastes revolves around the purpose and meaning behind every labor our mortal lives take. In this opening statement, he shows us how all things are filled with the labor. Labor is, to the outward appearance, the substance or pith that makes up our lives. It has been said that its fruit, to a large extent, makes up the sum total of our human existence. We see in the opening thought of King Solomon how labor is the course or circuit of all the creation. One generation comes and goes, yet the earth abides the same. As one generation rests from their labors, the next generation takes up the yoke, and they in turn pass it on to yet another generation. And so it goes. The creation itself reveals this truth. We see the sun rising and setting from day to day, shedding its warming and life-giving rays as it makes its daily journey across the heaven. The wind, too, courses from north to south and from east to west in its circuit, bearing along the seeds of life in its ethereal arms. The rivers run their course, carrying their life-giving waters from mountain to sea and returning from whence they came. All things are indeed full of labor, so full in fact that man cannot truly give utterance to it all. As we behold the endless labor of all God's creation, we see that no matter how long man may live, his life will never be full of living, nor his eyes with seeing, nor his ears with the hearing. For there will always be more to this short life of ours than can possibly meet the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, and the touch. Yet labor, despite its apparent futility, to many is in reality the all-consuming thing in this life. To many, the all-absorbing question in life is, what can I do or experience next? To yet others, it is the yardstick whereby they measure not only themselves, but everyone else. When they first meet someone, they will often ask the question, what is it that you do for a living? Or something of the sort. I've often wondered, why do we ask such questions? Perhaps it's just because it is a good icebreaker, though I think there is more to it than just a conversation piece or a way of introduction. I believe that more often than not, it serves as a means of evaluation. What I mean is that to many, what a person does is often how they subconsciously esteem or value that person. The degree to which we value or esteem their particular line of work will determine their value to us and to society at large. Why is it that we value one line of work more than another? This is a question that deserves an answer. Yet it can only go so far in answering the ultimate question. 
what profit is there in all of man's labor under the sun? This is the all-important question, and King Solomon begins to answer it in the opening verses of chapter 2. I said in mine heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water, to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle, above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold, and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments, and that of all sorts. So I was great, and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatsoever mine eyes desired I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. What a life! King Solomon lived a life that would make all the rich and famous of our day envious. Most of us have only dreamed of doing the things that King Solomon actually did. I'm sure that you, like me, have dreamed of accomplishing great things in our lifetime, whether it be noble aspirations like ending suffering, building a better world, or the more mundane such as living our dreams or experiencing everything that life has to offer. All of us have dreamed similar things, yet we, unlike King Solomon, only dreamed of them. And more important, than experiencing it all is the lesson that his life experience taught him. There was, perhaps, no other human being as qualified to speak upon the subject of what life has to offer, with all its labors, joys, sorrows, pleasures, and experiences, as was King Solomon. For in the very next verse he himself declares, But what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? Though he saw and did it all, and withheld nothing from himself that would serve to gratify his pleasure or curiosity in life, yet he found in it all only vanity and vexation of spirit. How on earth can this be? Surely one who has experienced all that life and untold riches have to offer should know just how satisfying and rewarding such a life is, right? Well, so we think. But this is not the testimony of one who knew from personal experience the true reality of such a life. In verse 18, he expresses what is perhaps the real underlying reason for all the vanity and vexation of man's labor. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. Just think about it. What good is all our labor? if we cannot take it with us. Even the thought itself is troubling and vexing. Who would not be overcome with the vexing thought of the vanity of having to leave it all behind for others, many of whom will have no true appreciation of its value? And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored, and wherein I have shown myself wise under the sun? This is also vanity. Such a thought is indeed vexing, yet its lesson goes far beyond this. For when we cease from our labor on earth, that is, when we die, we go to the grave empty-handed. We may have stockpiled untold treasures, 
seeking to leave a glorious legacy that will follow us into the afterlife, as did the kings of old. But the truth is that no earthly treasure can be taken with us to our eternal home. This thought is the source of many a rich man's misery. And in order to cure men of this vanity of vanities, Jesus admonished the rich men of his day. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. The only treasure that will endure unto everlasting life, in truth, is not of this earth at all. It is the gift of Christ Jesus and it is the rightful property of heaven. That gift is Christ's own life, for only a Christ-like character will be permitted to pass the gates of New Jerusalem and have a place in God's eternal kingdom. It is a well-known fact that all labor builds character, but the truth that is not so well-known, or should I say, which is sadly neglected, is that not all character is of value to God. Only a character like Christ's is valued by God and will be permitted a place among the eternally blessed inhabitants of his kingdom. All life is building character, but not all character is equal. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. All labor that is not of Christ is wood, hay, and stubble and will be made manifest in the day of God. Only that labor that is in harmony with that of Christ Jesus will be counted as gold, silver, or precious stones. Such labor alone is the only lasting and eternal treasure. Yet it is not so much physical labor itself that builds that character, as it is the thought behind it. And so the real question is, what is the motive or spirit that prompts our labor? said Solomon. Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Here is wise counsel, from one who knew by experience. If we are laboring, as did Solomon before us, for the things and experiences of this life, if we are seeking to delight our eyes with seeing and our ears with hearing, if we are laboring for that one earthly experience that will fill our hearts and make them complete, then we are laboring in vain, and all our labor will, in the end, be found a vexation of spirit. It will be found a sorrow of heart for which there is no earthly balm. This is why the Apostle John, under divine inspiration, once wrote, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. If our love is bound up in the things of this life, we are doomed to suffer that vanity of vanities and vexation of spirit. Our affections must not be bound up in the things of this life, but in him who is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Christ's life is our perfect pattern. He showed us what truly gives meaning to life. By his selfless labor for the well-being and blessing of his fellow man, he showed us what labor heaven approves of. In following Christ in such a life, we are engaging in the only labor whereof the fruit will remain and can be taken to heaven. This is what Jesus meant when he said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. 
but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I would not have us be deceived into thinking that this earthly treasure can be stored up by human effort alone. Our effort alone cannot secure it. Neither can it be bought with gold, silver, or earth's most precious substances. Its price is beyond computation, and its wisdom is beyond the searching of the keenest minds of earth's wisest sages. Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. How then is this heavenly treasure saved up? By repentance. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. To repent, according to the scripture, is to change our mind about something. It's to change the way we think. It is in this way that we can truly change who and what we are. It is a true saying that a product is only worth as much as the source from which it is made. In other words, a fruit is only as good as the parent stock from which it is grown, said Jesus. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. You see, God is not so much concerned with our labor as he is with the thought that prompted that labor. In other words, what we produce is not as important to God as how we produce it. Because thoughts are what make up the substance of a man, therefore, God cares not so much for the labor as for the thought behind that labor. This is because our labors are the outworking or product of our thoughts. And this too is why the wise man concludes the whole matter by saying, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Every work or labor of man will one day be weighed in the balances of heaven, together with the thought and motive that prompted them. And only those whose labor was prompted by the fear of God and a desire to do what is right in his eyes will be found worthy of heaven. All other fruit will be found wanting or lacking the essential element of love, love for God and love for our neighbor. Only a labor prompted by love for God and our fellow man will effectively hew away the sin from our lives and fit us for a place in God's temple in heaven. Is your desire to take your treasure with you to heaven? Are you laboring for that treasure which shall endure into eternity? It is not too late to start saving up. If your life has been a life of vanity and vexation of spirit, God can and will right now change your heart and put within you the will and to do of his good pleasure if you will ask him. Won't you ask him right now? Shall we pray? Our loving Father in heaven, I thank you for the love that you have shown us in giving your dear Son, Jesus Christ, that we might be saved. O oh, Father, we see the vanity of our lives and desire to be free from the burden of our sin and to experience the peace and joy of heaven. O oh, give us of that heavenly treasure, I pray. Please forgive us of our sin and come into our hearts. Make them anew. Restore within us a right spirit and give us a clean heart. Restore unto us the joy of your salvation and lead us in the way everlasting, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus we plead. Amen. <laughs>